My, uh, my relationship with anthropology began um, uh, long before I knew what anthropology was. Uh, it had to do with the circumstances uh, in which I, I grew up. Uh, uh, I was raised on a small farm in, in southern Saskatchewan. Uh, it was uh, an economically precarious uh, existence. Uh, an area that uh, uh, was a f f the farm fell within an area called Palliser's Triangle, uh, which is a geographic designation of uh, a portion of the northern plains that has uh, limited rainfall. Um, we were not in the driest section of Palliser's Triangle, but we were within the, within the triangle, and it, it, it's considered dry land farming. Um, you can get uh, periods of drought. Uh, you can get hailstorms. You can get various things that uh, uh, eliminate most of your income in a given year. Sometimes your entire income. My, my grandmother uh, on my mother's side uh, was uh, grew up in, in southeastern Saskatchewan, uh, about a hundred miles from where I grew up, and uh, uh, when she was uh, um, uh, raising uh, her family, including my mother, uh, they had three or four years with uh, no cash income. Uh, it was uh, subsistence farming essentially for a few years uh, because. They managed, unlike many of their neighbors, they had a well which did not go dry. And so they gardened and they were, managed to keep a few animals alive and uh, uh, they got through that period. Um, so that, that kind of history uh, within the family made me aware that uh, uh, what, uh, what we, uh, the way we lived was uh, actually good times. Uh, and we never felt poor. We, we always had uh, plenty of food, um, but uh, by the standards of the larger society, I suppose that we were, that we were uh, um, poor <laughs> in, certain, in certain sense. We didn't, for example, we didn't have indoor plumbing uh, most of the years I was growing up. I think I was a teenager. You know, so I, I acquired certain skills. You know, we had a wood-burning stove. Um, I knew how to cut wood. I carried water uh, from the time I was five or six, uh, was uh, helping to look after livestock. And those, uh, that kind of um, bodily discipline, I suppose, um, became um, a part of my, my being. Uh, in ways that uh, came back uh, in later ethnographic contexts. Um, came back as things that made working in certain settings easier for me physically. Um, although hunting is quite a bit different from farming, uh, but uh, um, but nevertheless, there are certain bodily dispositions that work, that transfer well between those contexts. I think more important in terms of at the level of the imagination, uh, that, that childhood um, made me quite aware and, and quite curious about what was there before, before us. And it was a very shallow history. Um, I was born in 1952. Um, and, um, you know, during, during my childhood years, there was still a, 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 an elder uh, uh, 
we referred to people on the reserve a couple of miles from our farm. Uh, it was known as the Indian Reserve. It was the Carry the Kettle uh, Assiniboian Reserve. Uh, but properly speaking now, Assiniboian refer to themselves as Nakota. So it's a Sioux and, um, language, uh, a member of the Sioux and language group. Um, there was an old man alive who uh, was a boy before settlement. He remembered as a as a <clears throat> I never met never met him, but I read uh, I read his book. Uh, he uh, he was uh, he was a young boy when the last of the bison were being uh, killed off, and he recalls he recalled in his book. Uh, um, out playing with some of his friends and coming across a, a field of bison that had been killed and left to, to rot. Uh, they were not yet rotting, but they were bloated in the sun. And he, he, he tell, told the story of he and his friends bouncing on the bloated bellies of the bison like a trampoline uh, kind of thing. Of course, a tragic, <coughs> a tragic scenario in which these children had found a way to make uh, a, certain, a certain game. Um, but that kind of uh, presence of people for whom we were, as settlers, we were just really newcomers, was something that was kind of there in the back of my consciousness. Of course, we understood the surveyed landscape and the the farms and the fence lines and the and the the grid of of roads as a kind of normal normal for us uh, but there were always ways in which <clears throat> even though we were socially quite closed off from from the reserve community uh, uh, there was nevertheless a presence that reminded us you know, and we would occasionally find stone hammer heads, uh, arrowheads, uh, you know, artifacts and evidence of, of, of people that, that came before. So I was quite curious about these things from a young age. Um, and I, I remember uh, a couple on a couple of occasions, I would be in the in the fields working with my father. Um, we would uh, one time we were putting up hay, and uh, someone that I would, you know, at the time I perceived as an old man. He was probably younger than I am now, but an old man came walking <coughs> across from a neighbor's uh, field, and this was struck me as highly unusual because. You know, all of the uh, uh, settler folks <coughs> traveled along roads. Uh, they followed the rectangular surveyed landscape. And this guy just came walking across, and disregarding fences and <coughs> probably following some, some remembered uh, route, or, or maybe not. It's the prairie. You can walk anywhere. Um, but he was coming to see my father. It was interesting. And uh, they had this very cordial conversation. Uh, and he talked about uh, maybe trading, doing some horse trading with my father. We still used, uh, uh, mostly it was tractor power by the time I was a kid, but uh, we still had a team of horses and we did some of our work with with horses, including uh, the, some of the haying. And uh, so I asked my father after, after the old man, he turned and went on, um, you know, what's the story with this guy? How do you know him? And uh, my father explained that he had, uh, in fact, he had traded horses with, with uh, my father's father, who farmed uh, nearby, uh, that farm was uh, about a mile away from 
from the one I grew up on, and uh, it was uh, one of my father's older brothers who had inherited that farm, and so we had cousins living there. But for our generation, my, my siblings, my cousins, my peer group, there was virtually no uh, communication with Nakota people. Uh, but I realized through this encounter that actually there had been a relationship in the previous generation, especially in my grandfather's generation. And then this old man, uh, who would have been between my grandfather and my father's generation, was trying to maintain a certain relationship. He knew that my father was unlikely to be buying uh, horses, but it was a it was a conversation to have that was uh, a neighborly conversation. And occasionally there would be um, uh, some uh, Nakota youngsters who would uh, go riding uh, past our farm gate uh, on, their, on their ponies. You know, the, the, they, were, they were horse, it was a horse culture and uh, um, they like to they like to go for go for rides occasionally, as I did. You know, I I became very um, very much attached to the wilder places in that part of of Saskatchewan. Uh, it was not uh, it was not the super rich classic flatland uh, that could be entirely monocropped. It was, um, there were some glacial, post-glacial moraines and uh, coolies, we called them, like uh, secondary valleys, uh, and uh, places that were too rough to be broken for agriculture were the places I loved. And I, I, had, a, I had my horse and I would travel all over. Uh, enjoying the spectacle of uh, white-tailed deer that we'd flush out, jackrabbits, uh, hawks screaming overhead, and uh, and one of my favorite places was a corner of the reserve, which was uh, uh, uninhabited largely. The, the the main community was more to the center of the reserve, and our farm was near a a corner that uh, only had one or two cabins um, a couple of miles into the reserve. Um, and there was a kind of a vague sense of trespass. Uh, and I was warned, you know, that I, by my parents that uh, that was other people's land. Uh, but the magnetism of that place, because it was, it was natural prairie, uh, was a little too much for me to resist, and I would uh, I would ride my horse, and I'd stay away from people's dwellings because I didn't want to upset anyone, or disturb anyone. But um, that was that was part of the the geography of my youth, and um, and these people that I hardly knew at all uh, interested me, uh, and, but I really didn't. Uh, meet, uh, really didn't meet them uh, until I moved to the city, which was kind of ironic. You know, I lived within two miles of this Nakota community for 17 years of my life before I uh, moved to the city for university studies. And uh, um, I met more, uh, uh, more indigenous folks in the bar rooms and back streets of Regina <laughs> than I had in my entire <laughs> previous 17 years. Um, you know, today we, 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 the term settler has become common. Uh, and certainly we were settlers, but uh, the, the, the self-designation of, of my community where, you know, we were farmers uh, and we were of uh, you know, descendants of pioneers. The pioneer was the was the kind of uh, historical reference and acknowledgement of our settler past. Uh, and I've I've thought quite a lot about that category more recently, um, because in some sense we were the classic settlers. We were people who came and 
my, my great-grandparents came and inhabited land which had uh, been recently vacated uh, at the time that uh, this Assiniboine or Nakota author that I mentioned, his, his name in English was uh, Dan Kennedy, at the time that uh, you know, his people were being confined to that reserve and, and, and uh, a couple of others uh, in northern Montana and, uh, uh, and some of the Nakota ended up uh, at Morley in, in, the, in Alberta as well. Uh, at the time that he was uh, an adolescent and, and a young man uh, enduring the starvation conditions of being settled on a reserve, my great-grandparents were, um, were settling, uh, were farming, had moved into farming. And I, um, I'm, I'm reminded of, a, of uh, Hugh Brody's book, uh, The Other Side of Eden, where he turns that notion of the nomad on its head um, and points out that indigenous folks are uh, uh, indigenous hunters who classically have been perceived as the nomads uh, are uh, actually not the nomads. It's the farmers who are the nomads. Um, and, and the story of my family, we were all you know, peasant and farmer um, stock going all the way back to Scotland. And uh, at each generation, people were pushed out. And so uh, from Scotland uh, to Ireland, and there are still distant cousins in County Cavan, County Monaghan in, in Ireland, and from there to uh, some of them, La Chute, uh, uh, just near Montreal. Um, uh, others, uh, Mitchell, Ontario. And the same pattern, uh, you know, if you have, uh, if you have uh, four kids, only one maybe is going to get the farm. Two at most, if you've been a successful and been able to get a large farm uh, put together. Maybe you've got enough to, for two kids, but um, the reality is where most kids moved on and they just went to the next frontier. And so it was from Quebec and Ontario to Manitoba, from Manitoba to Saskatchewan. Uh, uh, one of my uh, father's older brothers uh, had to move to northern Saskatchewan it was the, that was really the last of the area left to be settled, pretty much. And when it came to my generation, um, it, homesteading was just about finished. There was a bit of land in the Peace River country uh, in northern interior British Columbia that could be homesteaded, but... Uh, um, it was it was it was pretty much finished, and older sons especially had to had to move on. So we were, in fact, very unsettled uh, across generationally. Uh, always always moving, always moving to the next place. Uh, and and I, I had a conversation uh, when I was. Uh, doing some of my first field work as a, as a graduate student with a, with a Cree man from Sasibi, uh, Robert Kanatawat. Uh, I happened to be in a hunting camp with, with Robert because uh, uh, one of Robert's uh, cousins was married to a close friend of mine from the next community south. And we're talking about um, uh, identity really uh, you know who who are you who are you uh, was Robert's question you know who are you and I said well you know I've got some Scottish and some Irish and some English and a little bit of Dutch and you know I told him a little bit about the history of movement and 
And he looked at me and said, you really don't know who you are, do you? <laughs> or where you belong. <laughs> and so Robert was very much in the spirit of, of you know, the, the point that Hugh Brody is making in, in uh, The Other Side of Eden, that uh, in fact, hunting peoples are pretty grounded in place. They have big places, especially in the Arctic and the subarctic, but they are places that they intimately inhabit generation after generation. And it's a very, it's a very different kind of, at, at one level, it's a very different kind of connection to place through time. But at another level, it's not so different, you know, because as a child, you grow up in a place and you develop attachments that are your world. You know, uh, for me, um, Ontario, Quebec, Ireland, Scotland, they were just ideas. They were, they were something that people talked about vaguely as part of family history. But uh, what was real for me were the deer and the jackrabbits and the you know, picking stones off fields and uh, putting up hay and uh, that was, uh, that was a life that um, uh, I imagined I would be, I would remain in. Uh, I, I loved, especially loved working with horses and cattle, dreamed, you know, of uh, 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 someday ranching. Uh, I wasn't so interested in growing wheat, uh, which was the main cash crop. Uh, but uh, it was not to be, you know, by the time I was 12, uh, my father uh, was giving me the very clear message that uh, uh, there was no future for me economically in farming. And I was the eldest of, uh, of the sons, and usually it was sons who would take on the farming. I had one older sister. The sisters would very often, they, they usually were more educated than the boys uh, because uh, they would either marry farmers uh, or uh, they would get nursing degrees or teaching degrees or certificates so that they could uh, support themselves uh, until such time as they perhaps married, most often married a farmer. Whereas the, the, the boys would maybe get grade six, grade eight education, and uh, then it was time to get serious about uh, your occupation. Uh, so uh, I was the first, uh, I, I was the first PhD um, in my entire extended family, uh, the, the, first, uh, the first PhD, and uh, my, uh, I had two second cousins who, who went to university for agriculture uh, masters, uh, but ours was the first generation to uh, have higher, so-called higher education. Uh, and it was really a function of kind of economic, we were economic refugees in a sense, uh, because there was no frontier left to go to. You know, you had to, instead of moving to new areas for farming and ranching, you, you moved to other zones of the economy.